it's an interesting point that we've gotten to now that I've started to discuss things like Dharma and Karma Yoga. I more or less expected this to happen. Um, there's the other side of the coin in all of this, as usual. And again, India says so. Things are never clear. <laughs> there's no end of traps. There's traps inside of traps. There's traps inside of solutions. Um, it's not that these traps are deliberately set, but they are inherent in everything. The Katha Upanishad says it best. The sharp edge of a razor is hard to climb over. Thus do the wise say, the path to enlightenment is very difficult. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you just think that you've worked something out in your head and boom, some nasty, unintended consequences rears its ugly head. Well, Friedrich Nietzsche wrote a bunch of stuff that was then used to justify the Holocaust and the Second World War and Nazi Germany and fascism and all kinds of things. I personally am of the school of thought that says that he wasn't really trying to do that. He wasn't trying to make the world um, make the world safe for the one percent <laughs> um, <clears throat> and for the one percent to do whatever they wanted to the ninety nine percent. I think he was simply saying there's two ways to look at our ethical system, and if we go back to the beginnings, we see that it evolved more or less organically like anything else. And, um, you know, there's two ways to look at it. And here's a way that I'm uh, saying our ethical system evolved, something of a conspiracy even. Um, Hinduism has all kinds of uh, things in it that you just want to leap on. <laughs> uh, the caste system, for one. Um, the fact that you're born into a caste. Um, it's kind of crazy. The whole point of it all, uh, according to Dharma, is not so much to make for a decent society, but to allow you to sort of be in the game, but not of the game. You personally, as an individual, not as some way to construct society so we can evade our responsibilities. You have to know where your responsibilities begin so that you can perform them, because you have to get by in this life. You have to know where your, your responsibilities end so you don't end up in that insane situation of death, uh, of Nietzsche's debt that can never be paid. The problem, of course, with that is the devil is in the details, and you know, as you know, people pointed out, or I even alluded to the Nuremberg uh, defense. I'm not a bad person. I'm just doing what my caste deny uh, demands that I do. Yes, but that is that's a guy making a case for his actions, defending his actions in someone else's eyes. I'm talking about up here. <clears throat> There's a lot of talk about how philosophy and psychology should not be mixed. I think that that's rubbish. That's uh, just Western categorization, I don't know, fetishism, gone a little bit too far. Uh, philosophy is just knowledge. Everything. Philosophia, love of knowledge. <laughs> uh, or love of wisdom. <clears throat> so I would say that I read the Gita, I read the Upanishads, I read all of these things psychologically. Um, I'm not talking about how to construct a social system <laughs> on Earth. India's got a social system that I certainly would not want to live under. I'll put it that way. Um, it's a social system that would have seen me remain exactly where I was born and never get educated. Um, I was born into the what I call the respectable lower, lower class. In other words, we had very little money, um, but, you know, a decent family type thing. Um, and the implication of the caste system is I should remain there and I shouldn't ask any questions. I should have continued to go to the Catholic Church, or I, actually I never did, but, you know, I should have become a good Catholic because that's my station in life. Um, I shouldn't have become something of a rabble-rouser in the Union. I shouldn't have done all kinds of other things. I should have just stepped into my lot in life, accepted it, and gone with it. No, no thank you. I don't want to live like that. <laughs> um, the way I see Dharma and Karma Yoga is I take stock of my own life. And I have to decide in front of the only judge that 
at least on a moral level, really matters. Me. Where my responsibilities begin and where they end. The point is not so much to for me to learn how to do well at what I'm doing. The point is to avoid falling into that horrible, paralyzed ball that Arjuna became when he saw the battles arrayed at Kurukshetra in the Bhagavad Gita. It's not that I want to uh, create a good social system. Uh, any social system that you create is not going to be good. It's, it's going to be... It's going to have casualties. It's going to have unintended consequences, or maybe intended consequences. There are those who say that um, the Bhagavad Gita was simply a propaganda document um, put together to um, start the counter-reformation against Buddhism and Jainism in India. Buddhism and Jainism other are called Nastika, or Nastik, because they encourage you, well, they, they don't accept the, um, the authority of the Vedas, the four Vedas. Nastika kind of means heterodox, or even heretical. Heretical, I don't think, is, is too strong a term to use for someone who is Nastika. It's, it's even to this day in India, it's a term of abuse, well, or at least of disparagement. Um, <clears throat> so, they were saying, never mind the priests, never mind your duty in life, never mind all of this stuff, because, um, you know, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, um, could have been an Arjuna in his life, but he chose not to. He chose to withdraw from the world, and um, or at least somewhat withdraw from the world, and essentially... I wouldn't say rebel against everything in Hinduism, but to essentially set up a new paradigm. Uh, instead of living in this world but in a detached manner, you detach yourself with only the minimum amount of living in the world as is necessary. It's just a question of emphasis. Uh, I go back to my favorite old quote from Seneca when he was describing the Etruscans versus the Romans. The, the Romans in, in ancient Rome, they believed that their immediate neighbors, the Etruscans, were very canny people and enigmatic and everything. And he says the difference between us, the Romans, and the Etruscans is that we think that lightning is caused by the collision of clouds. The Etruscans say that clouds collide in order to create lightning. It depends on where you place the cart and the horse here. I think, that I, I've studied the caste system throughout most of my adult life, and I think it's both a conspiracy and a social contract. Um, it just happens that the people at the top are the most determined proponents of casteism. There are exceptions to that, of course. Um, you know, the, the political system in India is fragmented along the lines of caste, and, you know, as anyone who's ever been to, uh, to, uh, to England will tell you, working class snobbery or lower class snobbery is a real thing. <laughs> um, and there, there is such a thing in India. The, the people disparaging the Brahmins, you know, the people at the top of the caste system, cunning, manipulating, uh, scheming people who just want to blind us all with their bag of hocus pocus to keep us at the bottom. Um, whereas we're the real Hindus, uh, we don't go in for any of this foolishness and, you know, this kind of thing. There's enough criticism of caste in India. <laughs> you, you don't have to uh, condemn India for it. India condemns itself for it all the time. But, again, there is an element of stability that caste brings, and it does, in its own way, allow the individual to so engineer his life or her life that you can just go through the motions. And that's the idea of karma yoga. Go through the motions in order to create a still space in the midst of life's mayhem. Um, it's quiet up here, it's chaotic out there, but that's okay, as long as it's quiet up here. Um, the Indian social system actually is quite good at providing people with that opportunity, but of course the corollary to that is if the system doesn't work for you it largely works against you <laughs> badly um, it's the same thing I, I suppose the usual criticism of the Islamic world if you're if you're a person who just wants to have truth told to him and you just want to believe what you know you just want the, to think that the world is a nice place and that 
that everything uh, there, there are no big problems that are solved uh, to be solved or to quest to be questioned no big issues too much thinking is not necessary not necessary it's something of a stereotype that the Islamic world is the place where you want to be because they've got answers for absolutely everything um, down to the length of the beard you should wear if you're wearing a beard um, you know which hand should you use to wash your you know genitals with although that's <laughs> third world wise, uh, wide, I suppose, but, you know, they just the Islamic world has so many rules. Same thing with the caste system in India. So these are kind of social contracts um, that are rampantly abusable <laughs> and rampantly abused. I am not here to apologize <laughs> for modern Indian society or Indian history or to present the country as any kind of a utopia or their ideas as um, a solution to anything. As I say, I tend to see all of this as stuff that is directed to us as individuals. Strictly in terms of the individual facing the cosmos. That's it. I believe Nietzsche wrote his uh, works based on that too. Um, I know a lot of people disagree. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and again, I have to come back to the original premise of this video, of this series. It's not so much that I'm saying that religion is a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, Matt Delahunty is right when he criticizes uh, the hypocrisy of the religious establishment or the various religious establishments and the abuses that take place and the sleight of hand that always seems to mean that the priests get all kinds of money whereas the flock get blessings in return. Um, I'm not going to deny any of that. It's just not the point of this little series that I'm doing. Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm trying to look at non-Western ideas and use them as something of a wedge to put into the atheist slash theist debate taking place here in the West. That's all. <laughs> there's tons, um, I won't say wrong, but there's tons of problems inherent in um, even slightly idealizing the East. Um, you know, or we in the West we go through various Orientalist uh, phases, and um, the 1960s was the most recent one where you know it was cool to look like a sadhu and wear beads and chant mantras and everything like that. But that fizzled out pretty quickly when people realized the reality of the situation. Um, the Gita to me is very useful to me. And I'm not promoting it in any way, shape, or form as a document to be applied to our society and used to judge other people with. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I have to make that abundantly clear. And something else I have to make clear as well. India has never idealized itself. <laughs> Ask Indians about their fellow Indians and about their country and about their country's history. You'll meet a fair number of nationalists out there, but the overwhelming majority of Indians, they've got a fairly, I don't know, jaundiced view of themselves. Um, Indians are renowned for their cynicism, I would suppose, uh, would be the word. Nothing impresses India when you consider what goes on in that country. The wonders and the mind-blowing experiences that are just part of the course of living there. Um, yeah, it's going to breed people that are pretty, I won't say apathetic, but pretty blasé. You know, like your stereotypical Parisian or New Yorker who's just seen everything and yeah, whatever. That's India, writ large. <laughs> so I'm not trying to say that um, India is in any way, shape, or form better than anywhere else, or Indian people are better than anywhere else. It's just that their philosophy is a good logjam breaker in certain ways to a, something of a, of a cul-de-sac that's taking place in Western thinking, I think. And I see it in the same way as I suppose I would see Nietzsche. He certainly <laughs> broke a lot of logjams.